Now joining us on the couch, we have Cara Thomas, who is Director of Research, Policy and Advocacy at Cherish Life Queensland. She also has a Master's in Community and International Development. You're also a registered nurse and a foster carer. Yes. Thank you for joining us, Cara. Thank you for having me. So tell us, uh, in your role, what are some of the, the chief concerns or, or information that the average person who maybe doesn't know about the pro-life side of, of the abortion debate should know before they really finalise their position and, and talk to their MP about this coming legislation? Okay. I think there's a number of important factors when we're talking about abortion. And one of those things is what does abortion do and what is it that we're removing? And as a civilised society, what do we deem is acceptable? So abortion, as from where I see it, from a biological medical perspective, is the intentional killing of an innocent human being. Mm -hmm. Now, science supports that statement, the science of embryology, um, and most credible embryology or any embryology textbook that I've had looked at so far says that from the moment of fertilization or conception, um, the unborn is a distinct living and whole human being mm -hmm. involved in developing itself from within. And there is no essential difference between the embryo you once were and the adult you are today. Mm. Differences in your size, your level of development, your environment or your degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying we can kill you then, but not now. And so that's one aspect that I think a civilised society needs to fully understand what the unborn are and what abortion does right. to the unborn. Because if the unborn are human, which science says they are, of course. then the, it is morally wrong, according to our laws, to unjustly kill a human being. That's right. So that's the first thing. It's a human... We, we all have the human right to life and abortion therefore undermines our human rights foundations of our civilised society. And so we need to decide what we think is acceptable in a civilised society to mm. deal with the issues that we are now experiencing. Yep. Uh, secondly... I, just on that point you just made, I think that alone demolishes most of the pro-abortion arguments wherever likely to hear because most of them don't take as a basic fact the, the person in this debate who ends up discarded as medical waste. They assume it's a discussion only about women and while categorically we're concerned with the health of women, it's not the woman's body who is terminated. We're, we're talking about a human life. We're concerned with a human life. There's nobody that's, that's eliminated or disqualified from that, from that very important conversation. Uh, secondly, from all the research that I have done, uh, abortion is ex extremely harmful to women. It's harmful to them physically. It's harmful to them mentally. Because uh, we're talking about the current Queensland abortion laws mm -hmm. uh, and the recent committee uh, into the abortion law reform, mm -hmm. the first committee came back and it highlighted that from all the submissions and the women that had presented that no woman wants to have an abortion. Mm. But yet that's the only thing we're offering. So we want to increase access to the one choice women don't want. Wow. Yep. We're not offering support services. We're not offering informed consent. We're not, infor we're not even allowing women to be informed on what the unborn are mm. to, make, to, to understand what it is. And so no woman wants to have an abortion, yet we've got 10 to 15,000 in Queensland, or 
according to Medicare statistics, 80 to 100,000 in Australia. Now, if somebody was doing something they didn't want mm. that many times in a year, maybe we need to look at the social circumstances surrounding why women feel that's their only option. Mm. Why are they being abandoned to abortion? And why is our state looking at basically state-sanctioned coercion? Yeah. by only offering access to one choice, a choice they don't want. Uh, and there is ample research. Uh, you watch the recent Hush documentary, which was investigative journalism into abortion. You look at any of the websites like iregretmyabortion.com, uh, Rachel's Vineyard. Uh, there's a number of other, and they're all the women, even um, after abortion, which is almost a pro-choice website and women are saying I was pro-choice but I don't understand why I can't get over this mm. what's wrong you know I other sites that say abortion didn't make me unpregnant or didn't it made me the mother to a dead child yeah. all of these things it's harmful mm. because it's it's removing a child that isn't just a piece of tissue mm. and when you're pregnant your whole body responds to that new life mm. and your body changes and everything is geared towards nurturing mm. this new human. Yeah. I think um, it, it has to do nearly irreversible damage to be denied the ability to grieve the child lost, denied by the social narrative that says it wasn't a child in the first place. And if you grieve it, you have to acknowledge it. And if you acknowledge it, you're going against all the information and narrative and agenda that's in the mainstream media and, and pro-choice arguments. Um, you're literally not getting the closure that any other parent would need it with the loss of a child, which, which is terribly unhealthy for you. We're now also joined by Catherine Toomey, who has a degree in media and journalism and spent many years as an international correspondent with both CNN and the BBC. You've also undertaken postgraduate studies in bioethics in Europe, and you're currently the chair of Priceless House, which is working at the coalface with women dealing with these issues. So perhaps you can share a bit more with welcome. Perhaps you can share a bit more with us uh, about the harm to women which should concern every Australian when considering the abortion issue. It's interesting the way you've introduced me actually, David, because it sounds so, uh, it sounds like there's a dichotomy in my current role with my history. Yeah. But th just to give a bit <laughs> of background experience. there, um, the only reason I entered into the space of media um, was because I recognised and acknowledged even as a teen that there was this great gap between um, the experience of those who were facing vulnerable pregnancies and the way they were oppressed in, in, in so far as what you referred to before, their voices were not being heard. Mm. And I felt that um, it would be my duty, in fact, to enter into a space to understand how we could better identify the rhetoric uh, to, in fact, better present So they the really arguments. do connect quite well. So there is a connection. And, um, and at the time I was studying psychology originally and acknowledged that there was a, a big gap as well in probably um, creating better practices for an alternative, an alternative support base of agencies who really kept up to speed with best practice um, counselling, uh, integrated holistic models of support mm. because it's good and fine to say, yeah, sure, go on, continue your pregnancy and see you later. Mm. But that's just not good enough. No, that's and right. And that's where Priceless House comes in. So it's been an honour to be able to work with the background that I have and the business acumen that I have mm. with this incredible 30-person strong volunteer team with excellence in skill sets, etc., um, in really being a driving and leading force in our community yeah. that says, you know what, if we are truly being pro-choice, 
then let's offer choices. Yeah, and absolutely. And what does that mean? Yeah. And um, and so that's what we specialise in at Priceless is yeah. is not just Great. being, you know, this pie in the sky ideal, but being that coal face reality of saying you're there and we're going to walk that journey with you no matter what it takes. So tell us more about the work that you're doing, perhaps some anecdotes, some data, which is always valid in any um, decision ab about how women are experiencing this and the solutions that you're offering. Prices House is um, really robustly set on a variety of different empirical research that's been conducted across the globe. Um, and that research shows that there is a lot of hurt Mm. that women are facing when um, experiencing termination itself. Mm. Um, so personally, in studying, again, the rhetoric of the, of the pro-life movement, I think there's been a huge failure to communicate. I think that this baby focus has really hurt the movement. I think that women have been left out of that mm. and we need to change that rhetoric. And it is important to say, you know what, if we're going to be there for the baby, we can't not be there for the mother. Absolutely. And, um, and that's unfortunately been the way that some decades have of, of this conversation have gone, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's hurt people. Um, Priceless House has been running for 21 years, um, but our model in the last three years has really changed. It's changed from that, okay, we're available via the phone and we're going to help how we can, to in, incredibly increasing in our... Um, excellence in now striving for again as i said best practice um, so the evidence shows um, dr philip nay's research at his hope alive he's a canadian researcher shows that um, post-abortive grief is is a very real experience mm -hmm. um, and so we offer a 30 week long program wow. for those who've been affected by their abortions um, because that's that seems like a long time but often we'll have people come in who are 60, 70, 80, wow. who have had this hanging over them and it has systematically destroyed a whole part of their living experience. Mm. And it, they're finally, um, you know, they've gone to psychologists and psychotherapists and counsellors and paid lots of money or they filled holes by being, you know, brilliant in business or this or they haven't gone on to marry or they haven't been able to parent their children in, um, in the same way because they've got, you know, the past uh, hanging over them. So that acknowledgement is only where it begins and then the next 30 weeks is where it unfolds. And Dr. Philip Nay's research and, and program is, is what Priceless House offers um, at, and it's called the Hope Alive program again for anyone watching who, mm. who feels that they need um, to access that. We'll put the details for links at the bottom of the video. Mm. Yeah, and so, so that's just one aspect, the post-abortive grief. But, of course, there's pre-decision stuff as well. Come back to pre-decision stuff, mm. but in describing post-abortive grief, um, it sounds like there's a lot of different ways that can manifest and present for a long time. You know, you're talking decades later. Um, how comparable, just for, for viewers who maybe this is the first time they've heard that there's a negative consequence to abortion at all for the woman, um, would it be comparable just for something to hang our hat on to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? What's the similarity? Is it limited or pretty comparable? Um, my understanding from our counselling team uh, is that there's direct correlation and that analogy is spot on. In fact, it is PTSD. Wow. And, um, and like PTSD, it may not have the symptomology related to it immediately. You know, it might not present itself for some time. And in fact, some symptoms are... Um, in, go alongside with the justification and you see a lot of people who are vehemently um, promoting, in fact, even the current bills as part of their way of dealing with their own abortion experience mm. at first. And it's only some time later that they are in that place of acknowledgement, um, acceptance instead of denial, mm. that then things things come about and I mean it can manifest in a variety of ways it can just be as simple as that birthday coming around every year that baby was supposed to be born and then there's a deep depression that hits it can be um, hearing cries in the night that uh, that wake you up um, and that there's a lot of hormonal relationship in that that I think was being um, referred to earlier by by Cara 
Um, and then you've got suicidal tendencies, self-harm. One very disturbing self-harming behaviour is, in fact, um, the continuance of, of um, it's sort of this perpetual cycle of trying to replace the child. Mm. And so very quickly we see on the back of an abortion that was, again, probably usually a, a hasty decision, and that hasty decision-making is, is critical to that then hasty replacement and then the hasty I'm not worthy and then I'll better abort again. And you see multiple termination and that is self-harming behaviour. But what concerns us is that we are seeing in the clinics just a shrug of the shoulders. That person comes back maybe for the seventh, for the eighth abortion and are never asked in the clinic are you sure you want to go ahead? Mm. So our role is to offer them that alternative, is to break that cycle and allow for healing in that space. What kind of concerns do you have for women with this current proposed abortion? Um, speak to it specifically in Queensland or, or generally? Funnily enough, the original bill was somehow named a woman's right to choose. And that was oxymoronic in and of itself mm. because it did not offer any framework for mm. true choice to exist. It didn't offer government funding for independent counselling teams to truly offer choice and informed consent. Informed consent's a big issue around these bills yeah. because already the access determination is just extraordinary mm. um, and in fact it is a fallback option often um, so uh, we had a call last week from a girl who had broken her ankle and was told by her doctor she needed to abort in order for them to uh, proceed with an operation on her ankle because the pregnancy would inhibit healing of her ankle goodness me we um, we hear How about Barrick? we hear this is day to day. And she was desperately finding some doctor who could have a second opinion, which we were able to offer.